right now. The heart of the battle, the eyes of the world, are all focused in on this one field. At 5 a.m., May 6, the Union Second Corps struck and struck in overwhelming strength and utterly destroyed the unprepared Confederate Third Corps. The Third Corps dissolved. It didn't fracture, it didn't break, it dissolved. How do we cross those fields in front of you at the far distant tree line? Because of daylight savings time, that wouldn't be 5 a.m., it would be 6 a.m. your time. Ready. Troops would have been streaming back across this field in utter disarray. And as everything falls apart and the entire right wing of the Confederate Army disappears, Union forces appear on the tree line in front of you. They infiltrate the woods to your right across the road. And the only line of defense that is left to the Confederates are 12 cannons that belong to Colonel William T. Poe. Fire! Fire and secure the base. Robert E. Lee is facing the gravest crisis of his entire life at this particular moment. As he watches all of his plans for taking the battle to his enemy, immediately disrupted, destroyed, disaster looms in front of him. Generals have no longer any commands to command. Men have no place for direction, and all of them heading directly for you, heading off this field, heading for safety. General officers like General A.P. Hill should be out there trying to rally their men. But in fact, they too are overwhelmed by a situation they have never encountered before in their lives. So they act in peculiar ways. We find that many a person, when they're overwrought, that their senses shut down on them and they have a tendency to revert to some former occupation, some element of comfort that they know that they can command. And in this particular case, a Lieutenant General, Ambrose Powell Hill, was not out in the field trying to rally his men, but actually was working with the 12 guns of home, serving on a gun crew not acting as a lieutenant general, but acting as a sergeant. The chief of artillery for the entire Army of Northern Virginia, William Nelson Pendleton, racing back and forth among these 12 guns, giving them encouragement, hoping, sighting their guns, acting like a lieutenant rather than as a general. These men have advocated their responsibilities. And when they take on the responsibilities of their subordinates, that means that two people are now no longer doing their job. And at this particular critical moment, everybody should be doing their job and more. Robert E. Lee, faced with this crisis, this situation unfolding in front of him, does not have the help and support of the general he needs. And he is going to have to rectify this situation personally. Robert E. Lee will ride out to that field in front of us to try to rally the Confederate Third Corps. As you already heard from Eric at our very first stop, that Robert E. Lee is the living embodiment of the Confederate Army, the Confederate will, that the men trust and believe in him. There is something of a benediction in the man as one Confederate wrote. So he would be the perfect talisman to ride out there. <coughs> calm, serene, self-possessed, all those great attributes that we know in Robert Edward Lee are not going to be the Robert Edward Lee we see in that field. Because the situation is not one of veneration at all. As Lee rides out into that field and demands that the men stand with him, the men, badly frightened, disillusioned, 
ignore him. They leave him. They go off the field. And as they bypass the commander who tells them to rally on me, Robert E. Lee has to act in a most uncharacteristic way. He becomes brave. He becomes confrontational. He begins to curse at the men. He begins to challenge their manhood to make them stand. He tries to anger them so that they will act and think like soldiers. In the midst of this field in front of you, some of the best shock troops of the entire Confederacy are going to be streaming back towards us. A brigade of South Carolinians, a brigade in name only at this point. And in the midst of this flotsam was their commander, a brigadier general named Samuel McGowan. And McGowan tried furiously to get his men to rally. Will turn to staff officers and say, dress those men, make them stand. And he will get an answer from his own staff saying, they will not stand in the fires of hell. And they would not rally. Robert E. Lee rode into the midst of this moments later and confronted McGowan head on amid his men. And instead of saying, rally with me, General McGowan, stand with me, what he did say loudly was, my God, McGowan, is this your fine brigade running like a flock of sheep? That wasn't calculated to rally. That was calculated to hurt. He was challenging their existence. He was challenging their reputation, everything that they had achieved. And I guarantee that if you look at any major battle, of the American Civil War in the Eastern Theater, from 1862 on, and you pick where the maelstrom is at its most intense, I can guarantee that McGowan's brigade would be in the eye of that storm, infallibly. It's not just hyperbole, that's true. And here is a day that is no different, because they have been in the vortex of one of the most disastrous onslaughts that we can imagine. And they were crushed. McGowan himself was angered by what Robert E. Lee yelled at him. He had been challenged by Robert E. Lee, and he met that challenge. He spoke up. He said, we are not running, gentlemen. We are looking for a place to regroup, and we will fight as well as ever. Isn't that what Robert E. Lee wanted? Exactly that answer. But in truth, it's still failed. Because McGowan and his men have determined that this is not the place to fight, and this is not the time to fight. And they left Robert E. Lee in that field. They left him. And as Robert E. Lee rides back to this line of blood, he is watching the destruction of the Army of Northern Virginia. This could easily be the last day of the entire rebellion. Because the living embodiment of the Confederacy was dying before our eyes. Union forces have entered the woods in front of us. They are at the edge of the field and firing into it. Union forces infiltrating the woods beside us are literally firing across the road towards the artillery. The right sections are turning and fighting by blasting 